Heroes are quite simple. They help people, often through selfless acts. The blueprint for how a hero should behave has gone largely unchanged from its Greek origins with heroes like Achilles to the present day Chris Evans Captain America or in our sphere David Wright. Villains on the other hand are complicated. Their life's work is to overturn the actions of the hero, but why? The answer to that question tends to be deep and nuanced, with the effective villains generally having a dark backstory with only fragments of the truth known to the audience. I hope you can see this because I'm doing it as hard as I can. As a phenotype, the calling card of the sinister villain, the ultimate rebuttal to the clean-shaven everyman, is twirling a mustache. This character has existed in writing for centuries, but the film origins of this character can be traced to a 1913 silent film called Barney Oldfield's Race for a Life, which depicts a classic and often imitated scene of a damsel in distress tied to the railroad tracks by a vile yet slightly comical villain who of course has a phenomenal stash. Other fictional mustachioed villains include, but certainly aren't limited to, Professor Hinkle from Frosty the Snowman, Professor Fate from The Great Race, Dr. Eggman from Sonic the Hedgehog, Snidely Whiplash from Dudley Do-Right, Captain Hook from Peter Pan, Lord Licorice from Candyland, Wario and Waluigi who opposed Mario and Luigi respectively, and of course, Dick Dastardly. Life imitates art, so of course there are plenty of non-fiction dicks who've twirled the stash as well, like Joseph Stalin, Genghis Khan, Saddam Hussein, Bill the Butcher, and Vlad the Impaler. In baseball, a game where a guy stands there trying to hit a thrown rock with a stick while the other guy has the liberty to throw it right at his head, it's quite easy to decipher who acts as the hero and who acts as the villain. Without embracing the villain role in full, you've got untapped potential. So, is it a coincidence that one of the greatest pioneers of the pitching position, the guy coming in out of nowhere, sometimes in a funny car, to thwart the opposing team's lineup of heroes, had the greatest mustache in the history of the sport? No way. Go get some wax, gentlemen. Today we're going to celebrate the villain and talk about the remarkable career of Raleigh Fingers. Roland Glenn Fingers was born in Steubenville, Ohio in 1946. His father George had pitched in the Cardinals farm system and was notably a roommate of Stan Musial's, but he found himself working in a steel mill to support his family. They would move to Rancho Cucamonga, California when Raleigh was a small child. In Raleigh's Hall of Fame speech, he told a story of how at eight years old he played with matches at a friend's house, eventually catching the floor on fire and watching the fire department come and extinguish it. When George returned home from work, Raleigh was sure he'd punish him. But instead, the two took a drive downtown to the sheriff's office, and George had him locked in jail for three hours, what felt like three days at that age to Raleigh. This specific day spoke to Raleigh in several ways, in the irony that he would one day serve in the role of a fireman out of the bullpen. It was also a learning experience to keep himself out of trouble in the future, and he would come to respect the way his dad handled the high-pressure situation being creative as opposed to yelling and punishing him in an angry way. Handling high pressure situations would become the story of Raleigh's life. On Christmas Eve of 1964, the Upland High School product would sign with the Kansas City Athletics for a bonus of $13,000, turning down a $20,000 offer from the nearby Dodgers because he felt it was a fast track to the majors comparatively. Fingers moved up the ranks of the A's farm system steadily, with the only major setback being an incident during his opening day start for Double A Birmingham in 1967, where he took a frozen rope of a line drive to the face, knocking out several teeth and requiring his jaw to be wired shut for five weeks. He'd return in June, eventually turning in an impressive 2.21 ERA on the season. This was the offseason the A's would pack their bags for Oakland, but Fingers would stay in Birmingham for the entirety of the 68 season, with the exception of a September call-up where he'd only log one appearance, giving up four runs in relief in a 13-0 loss to the Tigers. He'd refine his slider and changeup in the Arizona Fall League that offseason. 
In 1969, Raleigh Fingers made the big league roster as an accessory to the core four-man starting rotation of Blue Moon Odom, Chuck Dobson, Jim Nash, and Catfish Hunter. Veteran reliever Mudcat Grant would join the A's in 1970 because I guess they needed a monopoly of players with catfish nicknames. Mudcat would serve as a mentor to Raleigh before retiring in 1971. 1971 also saw Dick Williams take over as manager, and he would fit fingers into the bullpen for good, filling the hole in the rotation thanks to the emergence of Vita Blue. The early 70s would become the gold and green standard of success for the franchise. They also marked the peak of animated owner Charlie Finley's quirky gimmicks that would set the A's apart, not only in the American League, but in baseball history itself. He invented orange baseballs, gracing Time magazine that never caught on. Not because they didn't stand out during play, just that they had no grip whatsoever and they were a liability coming out of a pitcher's hand. He also deployed a mechanical rabbit named Harvey whose job was to deliver balls to the umpire. For spring training of 1972, Reggie Jackson showed up with a mustache and refused to shave it. In protest, his teammates began to grow theirs out as well. Charlie Finley saw all the facial hair as a way to make a buck, while bucking baseball tradition as he often did. Finley offered a cash prize to the player who grew the best mustache by opening day. And though the stash would also become Reggie Jackson's signature look, we all know who won. This fueled a stadium promotion called Mustache Day where fans could get in free with the right facial hair. The A's would win their first of three consecutive World Series titles that year against the Big Red Machine during the peak of their success. They'd also outmatch the Mets in 73 and the Dodgers in 74. An all-time moment, check out Fingers faking the intentional walk of Johnny Bench to sit him down. Classic villainy against one of baseball's biggest heroes. Stemming from a phone argument with Finley over his contract for the 73 season, Raleigh Fingers vowed to never speak to Finley again, so he hired his first agent to talk to him instead. In 76, Finley dealt Fingers to Boston alongside Joe Rudy and dealt Vita Blue to the Yankees, anticipating he'd lose them all in free agency. Commissioner Bowie Kuhn blocked the deals and was subsequently sued by Finley, who'd lose the suit. Despite Finley spreading rumors that Raleigh Fingers was washed up, the San Diego Padres signed him for $250,000 a year, nearly triple what he was making in Oakland. While in San Diego, Fingers would surpass Hoyt Wilhelm as the all-time saves leader, ultimately etching 341. The job of the closer was a bit more demanding in those days. They worked harder per save. Most contemporary closers only handled the ninth inning. It wasn't uncommon to see Raleigh Fingers enter in a high leverage seventh and go the distance. With the active roster sitting at just 25 players, opposed to the current day 40-man roster, it was slim pickings in the bullpen, so each guy had to eat some innings. Alongside Goose Gossage and Sparky Lyle, Fingers was part of a movement to prove that the style of some pitchers was just made for the bullpen, and they best served their team in such a role. Raleigh Fingers would return to the American League to begin the 1981 season with the Milwaukee Brewers. They were a young, impressive team offensively, but they lacked consistency on the mound. It seemed Fingers would have undoubtedly delivered the greatest bullpen season of all time, had the season not been shortened by the players' strike. He saved 28 of the team's 62 victories. This netted him not only the AL Cy Young Award, but the MVP award as well. At the time, he would become only the second reliever to ever achieve this. The Phillies' Jim Constante won it in 1950. Two more notable mustaches would collect the award, Willie Hernandez in 84 and Dennis Eckersley in 92. In 1982, Fingers would tear a muscle in his right forearm and finish out the season on the injured list. Watching his Brewers advance to the World Series, eventually fall into the Cardinals. He would remain sidelined for the entirety of the 83 season, but return for 84, showing a few last glimpses of brilliance before his velocity and stuff atrophied in 85, he would be released. The Cincinnati Reds were adamant about signing the then 38-year-old Raleigh Fingers, but the team's strict facial hair rule would require him to be clean-shaven. Fingers weighed his options and responded, I'll shave my mustache when Marge Schott shaves her St. Bernard. He announced his retirement from baseball. 
His mustache was a shoe-in for number one among mustaches all time on Baseball Reference. Yes, this exists. Keith Hernandez's mustache has its own Baseball Reference page sponsored by Gillette Fusion Razors. The Hernandez stash comes in at number four all time. Raleigh Fingers walked so other closers could run. His Hall of Fame induction in 1992 gave the position some much needed credibility and played a big part in allowing other closers to follow in his footsteps to Cooperstown, molding the idea that intimidation goes hand in hand with effectiveness from 60 feet and 6 inches away. Fingers is spending his life after baseball on the golf course for the most part, but don't be surprised to see an old villain become a hero in the eyes of the game's young fans from time to time.